Editing. Taking footage and assembling it in a sequence in order to tell a story. Editing has gone through many stages in its life, from lining up pictures to cutting film to the digital editing we see today. The Zoopraxiscope. Invented by Edward Moybridge in the 1870s, it went on to create the first film, Sally Gardner at a Gallop. The Zoopraxiscope was a device that could project images from a glass disc. The photographs had to be painted onto the disc in order for it to be played as the photos themselves couldn't be projected. Shortly after, the Lumiere brothers built the cinematograph. The Lumiere brothers had invented the movies. This was huge for editing, as you had physical film to cut and project. It could also develop the film, making filmmaking much easier. The cinematograph was used to make the first ever special effect, the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots. Exhilarating. Even though this is unpolished and obvious, we use this technique today, no just like a Game of Thrones. Of it just goes to show that some of the older techniques are still the best. The guy that really made a difference to editing was Georges Méliès, a French filmmaker in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Can we take a second to just appreciate that moustache? Wow. Georges Méliès's most famous film was A Trip to the Moon, made in 1902. It was the first ever sci-fi film in which scientists adventure to the moon and battle aliens before returning home. He was well known for his inventive use of editing to create special effects. It's cool to see how far we've come since then. We no longer rely on just editing to create the effects. We can create whole worlds with just our computers. God. You should see your faces. Not long after Melier, we saw Buster Keaton enter the movie business in the 1910s. Buster was very important for editing as he demonstrated a very important editing technique, knowing when not to cut. This was important as it allowed the viewer to focus on what was happening within the frame. Over editing leads to a choppy piece. By knowing when not to cut, you are able to better pace a scene. Here is a horrible example. Okay, so let me run through why this is so bad. You don't need this many cuts. They add nothing to the scene. This can be done in one or two shots, as they prove in Kingsman. He also had excellent pacing in his films. Originally, he was supposed to make the jump, but he thought it'd be interesting to work it in. During Buster's time as a filmmaker, the moviola was invented. Look at the picture on one side, here's where the picture will be, and the sound is over here. This was a big development for editing, as it was now possible to watch what you were editing as you went. The original model was invented in 1924 and in 1929 a model was released that included audio editing. This marked the beginning of the end for silent film. The Moviola was used to edit some of the biggest films of all time, Citizen Kane and Psycho being two massive ones. Psycho was directed by the master of suspense, Alfred Hitchcock. His view of editing was so creative, just look at how he understood montage. Uh, montage means the assembly of pieces of film which moved in rapid succession before the eye create an idea. He basically invented a new type of montage. He made the impossible possible through the power of suggestion. He goes on to describe editing as the, the orchestration. orchestration. Loud notes, soft notes, and so forth. In the film, we see the orchestration through his cutting between shots. He starts on a mid-shot, then goes to a bird's eye view. And then to a shocking close-up as the man is slashed across the face. Now, 
This is size of image put together to create shock. In other words, if it were music, it would be tremolos on the violin and suddenly a brass instrument, which is the big close-up. And from that he fell and went back. There is also a technique called the Kuleshov effect, which Hitchcock goes on to discuss. Let's assume he saw a woman holding a baby in her arms. Now we cut back to his reaction to what he sees, and he smiles. Now what is he as a character? He's a kindly man. He's sympathetic. Now, let's take the middle piece of film away, the woman with the child, but leave his two pieces of film as they were. Now we'll put in uh, a piece of film of a girl in a bikini. He looks, girl in a bikini, he smiles. What is he now? The dirty old man. He's no longer the benign gentleman who loves babies. That's the difference. That's what film can do for you. This technique was developed by Lev Kuleshev, a Russian filmmaker in the 1920s. It demonstrates the power of storytelling that an editor has when they assemble a film. The order of images changes the meaning of a scene as it is all down to what we imply when given information. The next technological advancement was the Steenbeck flatbed 16mm 4-play ST200 editor. Catchy. This made editing much easier as it was much quieter than the previous Mo Viola. Take a listen. Editing on the Movio that was the best way to edit from its release in 1953 up to the 80s. Ten for picture, and then ten for sound. Let's imagine I have two two pieces of film that I want to splice together. Those. Put them in here again. Get close. And uh, if it's picture, I use this clear tape. You can see through it. And we put it just on two of the little sprockets, and we have to do it on both sides. Voila. So that is editing. I just made an edit. But before we get to the next thing, there was something very important edited on the steam bag. Is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? Caught in a landslide. No escape from reality. Bohemian Rhapsody was released by Queen, and if you didn't know that, then just stop. Leave. Okay, great. In 1975, this changed what people thought was possible for music videos. There's exciting visual effects, making the band a kaleidoscope and having them fade off in exciting colours. While these are simple when compared with modern music videos, at the time this would have likely been mesmerising. Since then, visual effects have become more prominent in music videos, but are now done by an effects artist rather than by an editor. Okay, I know what you're thinking. What was that? What is this dull logo sliding onto screen? Where's Ariana gone? I know it's not that impressive, but what if I told you that what you just watched is the beginning of modern day editing? I'd like to show you the system right now. Avid One. The first digital editing system, and it was released in 1989. So what made Avid so special? Well, in normal video editing, you can only overwrite the material. In this nonlinear editor, you can splice in, just like in film. This totally changed how people edited. We now had a timeline which showed a non-linear view of what was being edited. This gave editors the ability to go back and change the mistakes they made, rather than just being left with a big problem and saying, oh, fuck. Avid led to the likes of Premiere Pro, DaVinci Resolve, Sony Vegas, Final Cut, and all other editing software. Some editors took a long time to switch to the modern side of things. Michael Kahn, who edits most of Steven Spielberg's films, used the Moviola to edit until 2011. His most famous work would be his Oscar-winning editing for Raiders of the Lost Ark in 1981. What the most difficult part for me was that wall coming down. Every time it came down, the next cut was higher. The next cut was higher. But I got away with it. Nobody ever mentioned it. 
Adios, señor. That, that was something you could do in the editing. You know, you could, you got to do things like that in order to you know, get some suspense on Indiana Jones. So you know, if, he, if he let the door close, he's screwed. <laughs> he's had it, baby. Use digital editing for the first time for the adventures of Tintin. Thanks. I'm Tintin, by the way. Haddock. Archibald Haddock. Well, this is a fine mess. Like Michael Kahn, another significant editor in modern cinema is Lee Smith, who edits most of Christopher Nolan's films. And here we go. Break. Uh, Dunkirk was very, very little exposition. And uh, it, it was going to be a very visual film. And, and the visual storytelling, you know, is what was going to make this film worth watching. His editing has a great flow and he creates a great pace to the films he edits. He also does a great job of creating suspense. Look at the opening scene here for Dunkirk. It's relying on a, a level of suspense that Chris said earlier that he wanted to maintain. He wanted to run this feeling of your heart beating away right from the first frame of image. You're starting to get tense in that first gunshot. Boom, you're tense pretty well all the way through the movie. We never see the shooters, just the soldiers running. This draws focus to the struggle of the soldiers rather than relying on big effects to tell the story. And of course you layer on top of that the intersecting timelines which Chris loves to play with time. You get this kind of war movie like no other which is not reliant on um, you know carnage and, and blood in the camera. Like some films do. burn you. I will burn the heart out of you. I have been reliably informed that I don't have one. Sherlock, one of the best edited shows ever. Let's take a look into one of my favourite scenes. What? I saw it too. In this emotionally charged scene, Just we see Sherlock becoming increasingly distressed due to the hound. hound. Out there in the hollow. <laughs> As he deduces over the mother and son, the editing remains somewhat slow, allowing the audience to keep track of what's happening, creating a beautiful parallel between Sherlock and the mother and son, rather than just being cut, 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 like some things do. It also draws focus to the acting of Benedict Cumberbatch and lets us witness his emotional performance. He was on the same train as us and I heard her calling its name and that's not cheating, that's listening. I use my senses, John, like some people. So you see, I am fine if I have never been better. So just leave me alone. The show also makes use of some great visual effects to go with the editing in order to give us a look into what Sherlock is thinking. This is past K. The width of the plane is the limit. The mubbers always appear randomly and not in sequence. But the letters have little runs of sequence all over the place. Families and couples sitting together. Only a jumbo is wide enough to need the letter K all rows past 55, which is why there's always an upstairs. There's a row 13 which eliminates the more superstitious airlines. Then there's a the style of the flight number 007 that eliminates a few more. And assuming a British point of origin, which would be logical considering the original source of the information and assuming from the increased pressure on you lately that the crisis is imminent, the only flight that matches all the criteria and departs within the week is the 6.30 to Baltimore tomorrow evening from Heathrow. Airport. These are just a few examples of how great editing can really make a show memorable. They are, brother. I hope the contents make up for any inconvenience I may have caused you tonight. I'm certain they will. If you're feeling kind, lock her up, otherwise let her go. I doubt she'll survive long without her protection. Music videos also improve with digital editing. Girls Like You makes use of a great combination of camera work and editing to create this seamless effect. The parallel editing in You Are The Reason is another great example of modern editing.
from one scene to the next throughout the whole video as if we were just peering into people's lives through a window. Visually, we can see a huge development from the old days of a kaleidoscopic queen. The effects are more technical and in my opinion more impressive and used to a greater effect. To finish this all up, let's look at my favourite piece of editing. Baby Driver. Paul Macklis was the mastermind for this spectacle of editing. Let's have a listen. One scene in particular, I remember there is a shootout in Baby Driver um, in a warehouse and it's to a track called Tequila. And this particular version was recorded in 1970 by a group I think called the Button Down Brass. And in the middle of it is a fantastic uh, drum solo. Edgar came up with this brilliant idea of why doesn't the, as, as per the character of Baby and in fact the kind of whole undercurrent of the film in which uh, a real life seems to magically synchronise to the music that Baby is listening to on his, uh, on his headphones, uh, why doesn't the gun battle happen to fall in to the exact beat of the drum solo? <laughs> And so he designed this sequence with the stunt guys and our choreographer, Ryan Heffington, that actually every shot fired by our characters and the, the, the gang uh, in, in the scene all magically fit to the beat. So the bullet, the bullet, shot, uh, the bullet hits and the impacts and the, the, the firing are, are bang on time. Each shot is perfectly edited to the beat every action in perfect synchronization with the song to create a brilliant piece of cinema. Get us out of here, baby, let's move. Come on, let's go, move. This was amazing to watch, as while well, any idiot can cut to a beat, this was total synchronization. Every shot represented part of the drum solo. The guns themselves became instruments. Tequila. So this is editing, an ever-evolving art key to the production of film. I wonder what's next for editing.